Welcome back to Avenue series of policy conversations with our candidates running to be mayor of this great city. Before we begin today, I want to take a moment to recognize the horrific acts of violence that took place in Atlanta this past week. The shootings are part of a deeply disturbing increase of violence against Asian Americans that have been happening across the country since the pandemic began, including right here in New York. It is appalling, frightening, and unacceptable. It's also a reminder of how far we have to go to make things better. Abney stands with our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, really bedrock communities of our great and diverse city in the fight against injustice, violence, and racism of all forms. Today, it is our pleasure to welcome someone who has been a bedrock of our city, New York City controller, Scott Stringer. Scott has been a hardworking political leader for decades, really since he was a kid. And with all he has done as a public servant, he is no stranger to us at Abney. Now, you all know our city is fighting our way out of a crisis. Less of you may know that for Scott, that crisis has been deeply personal. This past Sunday, our city paused to remember the more than 30,000 New Yorkers, our neighbors, who lost their lives due to this terrible disease. One of those people was Arlene Six Stringer Cuevas, Scott's mother. Like so many others who lost loved ones early in the pandemic, Scott was not able to say a proper goodbye to his mom or to give her a proper funeral. Scott, we know how proud your mom was of you and your life of public service. And we want to say to you and your family that our thoughts and prayers are with you as you approach the one year anniversary of her passing. Now, if you're part of Avni, you know Scott started young in politics, that he served his local community board as a teenager in Washington Heights. He went from representing the Upper West Side in the State Assembly to representing all of Manhattan as the beep to representing the entire city as our controller. Today, as the manager of the city's $170 billion pension fund, he has used its tremendous investing power to leverage changes in boardroom, in boardroom diversity and environmental sustainability, all while protecting the important savings and retirement money of our city's men and women who need that money for their retirement. Now, as a candidate for mayor, he's rolled out plans to finance more truly affordable housing to create a new category of specialized first responders to deploy in situations involving mental illness and homelessness, to name just two of his proposals. One last thing I wanna mention about Scott, he's not afraid to do the right thing, even if it's not popular. During his time in the state assembly, he was a driver of ending empty seat voting, which had allowed legislators to check in for one moment during the day in the state house, and then cut out for the whole day and vote as if they had been there the whole time. Scott got booed, by his colleagues in the state assembly during that vote who were pissed at him for forcing them to show up, participate and stay there and not just swipe it and then leave. We appreciate Moxie at Avni, at Avni. We appreciate big and innovative ideas. And we're eager to hear more about Scott for your plans for the city as you as a candidate for mayor. Welcome back. Scott, zoom over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. And I wanna thank you, uh, Stephen, for that wonderful introduction to thank Melva. Uh, and Abney for all the leadership you give to our city. And I wanna welcome everyone on the Zoom. None of us plan it this way, but this week marks an important anniversary. Almost exactly one year ago on a Friday morning, I took my sons, Max and Miles to school. Elise and I got them up, forced them to eat some food for breakfast and off we went. When we arrived at PS 33 in Chelsea, they ran off to play with their friends and then headed in for their last day of school as we knew it. None of us could have imagined the challenges that year would bring for our family and our city. My wife and I juggled work while trying to keep our kids learning. All of this, yes, in a two bedroom apartment. It's my job as controller to look at these issues through the lens of policy, budget and accountability but I am also living them as a parent. And I'm a product of New York City Public Schools, a proud graduate of PS 152 and IS 52 in Washington Heights, and John F. Kennedy High School in the Bronx. So I know that while the pandemic laid bare stark disparities, make no mistake, these challenges have been the norm for schools across the city for decades. Impossible choices between going to work and caring for your kids. Overstressed teachers who have nowhere near the resources they need to meet the needs of their students. 
social emotional struggles unseen and unaddressed. A school system where 70% of fourth graders still aren't reading at grade level. It is long past time to tackle these issues head on, not with incrementalist thinking or back of the napkin gimmicks, but with a comprehensive plan to change what we provide to the children of this city. As mayor, I'll lead a transformational education agenda to help our children heal from the trauma of the pandemic, reckon with educational inequalities, and refocus our system to give every child the resources they need to flourish from birth to college or career. And I'll be ready on day one with a comprehensive plan to get it done. Now, it won't fit on Twitter, but I'm excited to share the details with you today for the first time. I wanna start by talking about our youngest New Yorkers because education starts when you're born at age zero. Now parents know this instinctively and science confirms it. 80% of a child's brain will develop before they turn three. Yet we as a society invest almost nothing in these early years. Quality infant care must be our first step on the education ladder. Now, if we didn't know this before the pandemic, we know it now. Without real childcare, there can be no real return to work. That's why as mayor, I will lead the largest local investment in childcare in US history. My NYC under three plan will slash childcare expenses for up to 70,000 New York City parents and triple the number of children in city back childcare. It's time for New York City to lead the way for the rest of the country and make childcare an essential, affordable first step for every family and every child. But we can't stop there. We need to innovate across the entire spectrum of education. We have an uphill battle to address the learning gaps and emotional trauma our kids have suffered over the past year. And to close those gaps, we need to invest in our classrooms, not the bureaucrats at Tweed. As mayor, I will build a new model for classroom instruction by making New York the first big city in America to put two teachers in every elementary classroom, K through five. That's double the support for every child, double the help for kids struggling with losses of the last year, double the capacity for questions, dialogue, interactive play, because that's what's really nourishes our children's imagination and creativity. Private schools and schools with wealthier PTAs already do this and they do it because it works. It's how you dramatically improve literacy rates, math proficiency, college readiness and more. But we can't let progress in our public schools depend on private dollars. My plan will level the playing field and ensure that all of our children in all of our schools can be inspired and encouraged in well-staffed classrooms. Teaching is more than a profession. It's a calling. Research shows that teachers are the most important ingredient to improve academic achievement. I've seen it, I've lived it firsthand. My mom, who Stephen talked about, well, she was a teacher for more than 13 years. And if she were here today, she'd remind us all that we expect teachers to work miracles, but too often they don't get the support they need. Many new teachers get just two weeks of in-classroom training in the summer before the first day of school. We put these educators directly into the classroom and expect them to navigate all the challenges that come at them. The result is we lose 40% of our teachers every five years, 40%. It's not fair and it's not right. And that's why as mayor, 
I will launch a landmark teacher residency program, a paid year long in classroom apprenticeship that can train up to 1000 aspiring teachers a year and equip them with the classroom skills they need. Veteran teachers can show them the ropes and our newest educators can walk into their classrooms better prepared for the realities of the job. And that means better outcomes for students, especially in low income neighborhoods where teacher turnover is the highest. You know, I had this, I had a young man who interned in my office two summers ago. His name was Muhammad Dean of Canarsie, incredibly bright. He took AP biology, right? His junior year of high school, but he lost his teacher mid-year. And after that, Muhammad and his classmates got a series of substitutes not trained to teach AP bio. None of them passed that AP test, which set them back when it came time to apply to colleges. But despite all of these roadblocks, road Muhammad was accepted to Hunter College. But losing his friend, his teacher, and his mentor right when he needed them most is an experience that still sticks with him. Teacher residencies would also help attract a more diverse pipeline of quality educators. More than 80% of New York City public school students identify as Hispanic, African, and Asian. But right now, only about 40% of our teachers say the same. Our teaching force should reflect the diversity of our city. It's critical that our children see themselves reflected in their educators. Let's give teachers the training they need to do what they do best, educate our children. Let's put two teachers in every elementary classroom so that every child gets the individualized attention they deserve. And when I'm mayor, I'll get this done. These ideas reflect a sea change in our schools and it requires serious investment. Stimulus dollars can help get us started, but we will need the funding to sustain these proposals for the long term. And I believe a budget is a statement of our values. And the Department of Education, with its $34 billion annual budget, is the largest single agency by far. As city controller, I've audited and analyzed DOE spending several times over the past seven years. And what we found is case after case of poor financial management, bloated opaque contracts, spending on outside consultants and ballooning costs at Tweed and field offices. I'll bring my record and experience to City Hall to root out all unnecessary spending. I'll bring transparency and accountability to DOE's budgeting. And I will direct education dollars where they can have the most impact, classrooms. This is money for our children and their futures. And to anyone who says we can't afford to give students what they're owed, I say we cannot afford not to. As we look to reimagine education in our city, we also must be clear-eyed about the current status quo. New York City is the most segregated school system in the nation. That is not just morally wrong, it is educationally unsound. As mayor, I will take a multi-pronged approach to integrating all our schools, bringing students together in the classroom, not separating them. I make the following promises today. I will require every district to set clear diversity goals and concrete roadmaps to meet those goals. I'll overhaul the broken admissions process for our specialized high schools. Just 10 out of 766 seats at Stuyvesant High School were offered to black students. As mayor, I will base admissions into our specialized high schools on seventh grade state tests, 
which all kids take and which actually test what is taught in the classroom. And I will permanently end the testing of four-year-olds in our city. Let's stop deciding that some children are gifted and that some are not before they can write their own name. Our goal should be to offer the highest levels of enrichment in every classroom. And that's the goal of my education agenda. And if we do it right, we'll make every classroom a gifted and talented classroom for all our students in every zip code. If we're gonna improve education access and quality across the system, we must finally bring digital learning into the 21st century. 100,000 of our children, many of them experiencing homelessness, were left stranded throughout the pandemic without reliable internet or devices to learn remotely. Many, believe it or not, were forced to go to extreme lengths, huddling on street corners around Link NYC stations for free Wi-Fi, wandering around their neighborhoods searching for weak connections, or not logging in at all. That ends when I'm mayor. My administration will close the digital divide and each and every student in our city will have access to free, universal, high-speed internet. That service will be at home and it will be on a working digital device. Now for too long, we've assumed that our responsibility to children ends after they leave the classroom. But we need to see the whole child. The deep loss and isolation of COVID-19 turned the lives of many students and families upside down. We must make sure our schools are equipped to handle the devastating toll that this year has taken on our kids. When I'm mayor, we will triple the number of social workers in our schools. And we will recognize that learning does not begin and end with the school day. It's called after school. And because I have this, I get to sit at a computer every year and use this to get my kids into a menu of after school programs. But access to high quality after school should not depend on your parents' access to a credit card. I will guarantee universal free high quality after school for children in grades K through eight from chess to sports, music, and extra tutoring. And let's work together to ensure access to paid internships, career exploration, and youth employment for all of our high schoolers. And I hope you today will help all of you. Each of you has the power to provide those opportunities. And as mayor, I'll be asking, but I'll also be helping. This can and should be a true collaboration between the public and private sectors. And finally, the city can do more at the end of each New Yorker's journey from birth to career. As a CUNY grad myself, I know firsthand how CUNY opens up opportunities for its students. We should make CUNY community colleges free so that anyone who wants to go to college can make it. Let's do that. On a day when I'm proud to be putting out a plan to lift up our children and the teaching profession, I would be remiss if I didn't address some comments made this week by Andrew Yang, in which he attacked our teachers and blamed them for the challenges of keeping schools open and safe during the pandemic. Perhaps Mr. Yang wouldn't have said what he said if he had stayed in New York last spring and seen an entire city of teachers make the best of the worst to teach our kids, even as everything they knew changed overnight. Perhaps Mr. Yang wouldn't have tried to score cheap political points at the expense of our teachers if he had come back this fall and seen them take their lives in their hands again to go back to school when no other big city in America was doing it. Now, for me, this is personal. As Stephen said, my, my sons lost their grandmother to COVID-19. And it's true, we didn't have a chance to say goodbye in the hospital. 
We couldn't sit shiver together to grieve. Isolated from most of their family and friends, my sons had no outlet to process the huge void she left in our lives. Max's teacher, Ms. K, reached out to them on her own time to comfort him, to listen to him, to help him find the words to express his pain. She was a lifeline for him and my family will forever be in her debt. That is the story of our teachers during the pandemic. They didn't get the tools or support they needed from the Department of Education. They didn't have working ventilation systems in many classrooms. They didn't even have windows that open, but they love our kids. And so they put our kids and our kids' education first. And some of them paid the ultimate price. Now, to be clear, I don't begrudge Mr. Yang making decisions that he felt were best for his family, but he clearly doesn't understand what so many went through. And the least he can do for our teachers is to take the time to learn and show respect for the frontline workers that they are. But the truth is that this is par for the course for Mr. Yang, whether it's an illegal casino on Governor's Island housing for TikTok stars, or being baffled by parents who live and work in two bedroom apartments with kids in virtual school. We don't need another leader who tweets first and thinks later. Running for mayor of the greatest city on earth in the most challenging time in a generation is serious business. And that's how I'll approach the job. And look, I wanna close by saying this. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. Many of you know me through my record of public service. And you know, I'm not gonna need training wheels at City Hall. But this is, this is about more than just a resume. The real question to ask me and anyone running for mayor is this, who are you really fighting for? What will motivate you to get to City Hall before dawn and get to work. For me, it's my kids, Max and Miles, my second grader and my third grader. I'm fighting for my kids, for your kids, for the kids we'll never meet. I wanna give our children every opportunity to succeed after the disruption, hardship, and loss they endured over the last year. I wanna build our children the strongest foundation for excellence. I wanna leave them a better city than we have. And a city that invests in the education of all of our children will be a better and stronger place to do business and build the 21st century economy that you as business leaders need. We are at a crossroads. The stakes couldn't be higher, but I believe that if we meet this moment with purpose, with vision and a proven ability to get things done, we can move forward out of crisis and into a brighter, fairer, and more equitable future for our city. New York City is the biggest school system in America. I'm running for mayor to make it the best school system in America and to make sure our children are better prepared and better cared for than ever before. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Scott. Um, you talked a lot about a lot of stuff. Um, and it, for someone who has been very concerned about the future education of our kids here in the city, someone who, I don't have kids um, and uh, I'm not a teacher, but I do understand sort of what's at stake and what's at risk. I can say I appreciate having a, a plan day one, ready on day one, right? I think that's your slogan. Um, so thank you for sort of talking about all of the things and innovative ideas in your educational plan and unveiling, unveiling that with us today. So I wanna unpack a little bit about what you talked about and talk about some other topics that I know our membership is really uh, concerned about. Uh, so first, you know, you, I know that you're a father of two public school children um, and you've seen firsthand the challenges and you talked about it a little bit this morning of parents, students, teachers and communities 
Um, you know, and you've laid out an ex extensive plan today, which is great. Integrating our schools and confronting the inequities across the city, which is extremely important. Um, over the past year, you know, I'm really interested in understanding what you think worked well and what you think did not work well. I think there's a lot of sort of learned lessons from this, like you talked about today, um, the universal high-speed broadband, right? And I think that's something that we, you know, and devices in every household. I think that that's something that we learned firsthand from the pandemic. But I'm really interested in understanding what did you learn? What did we learn from this pandemic that will carry us forward to ensure that all of New York City's children have the resources and opportunities to succeed in their educate? Excuse me, in the education system. It's a, it's a great question, Melva. And again, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Well, what I learned personally is I'm not a good remote learning teacher. This, this is hard. In fact, I'm a really bad remote learning teacher. And if that's a qualification for mayor, I'm done. Uh, but, you know, the point I was trying to make today is as it, it, is, is hard as it was for, you know, my wife and I to help our kids, we got a lot of privilege, right? We really do have resources, even in this small, you know, two bedroom apartment. And the thing that worries me, and I think that what came out of the pandemic was that there was a whole lot of kids, kids who lived in homeless shelters, kids in public housing, they didn't have working remote devices and they didn't have internet access. And in this pandemic, those devices were the school books that we used to get on the first day of school when, when we were going to school. And so we basically had no resources for so many kids and the DOE bureaucracy got in the way. And that is why we are looking at the role of all of these city agencies in the pandemic, not to play gotcha, but to understand how we can do better. Because unfortunately in this town, there will be another crisis. There will be another challenge. It's the way it's always been going back to when I came of age in the 1970s. And we have to be prepared. But I'll tell you what did go right, and I hope it came out today. You know, the principal who's outside every day with the sanitizer, that's powerful to me. Taking temperatures, watching the kids, the assistant principals, the teachers. And I hope that came across because I saw that when Max finally went back to school. And we have to build on that. And that's why I want to reimagine what public education can be about because we did see wonderful, beautiful things. We saw heartache, we saw loss. We saw bureaucratic bungling and stumbling. We saw an administration that was not nimble and fast, but we managed to get it done because we're New Yorkers and when we set our minds to something, we get it done. But there's a lot of lessons in this. Thank you for that. Um, and you know, keeping uh, in the theme of what you talked about today and unveiling, I think it's really interesting the teacher apprenticeship program. Um, and, you know, something that, you know, we think about daily here at Abney is about how do we grow and come back more equitably and inclusively. Um, so I'm interested in hearing about your plans as this would be rolled out for not only making sure that the apprenticeship opportunities go to New Yorkers that are very representative of the children who are in the schools, but also you talked about having two teachers in the classroom. And we know that there are a lot of barriers for our students around language access and cultural competency. Uh, how do you plan to infuse cultural diversity into that plan of apprenticeship and, and teachers in the classroom? You know, I think we have to, as I said in the speech, you know, we're losing our teachers every five years, 40%. And so this ramp up of two teachers is also gonna be about challenging the system and the city to have a clarion call for this amazing profession. And that means we have to use every tool at our disposal to reach out to black and brown potential teachers, give them the resources, the professional development they need. So when they're going in and making that career choice, they see a runway for how they can succeed. By the way, I didn't invent this. We do this for lawyers. We do this for doctors. It's called professional development. But somehow we throw the teacher into the classroom, right? And that teacher has to deal with a lot of things at the same time. Two teachers, one in the front of the room and one you know, roaming the desks. I cannot tell you what that would mean for kids. And that's what happens in private schools. 
And I know Andrew Rain is on this call today. I'm gonna to send him today how we pay for it because this plan has costs associated with it. And I have item by item how we get there financially, both in terms of stimulus package, how we can break down the bureaucracy at the DOE, move savings into the two teacher plan, but also look at different buckets of how we can get to more social workers and free community college. And all of this is laid out financially because you know when you're running for mayor, you can talk about 10 billion here, 20 billion there. And you know, we're who knows what's true. But I have I have the receipts to show how we implement this. This is great. And it's usually a question we ask, right? Candidates, you have these great plans. How are you going to pay for it all? So if you can also send us <laughs> that plan, that would be uh, appreciated. Um, all right. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll get Andrew to send it. No, I'll, I'll send it directly. <laughs> Great. Um, and just the last question on, on what you talked about in terms of your educational plan. You talked about true collaborators in um, sort of working to support financially all the things you talked about. And, you know, as uh, Abney celebrates 50 years this year, we are really a coalition uh, of real New Yorkers who are dedicated to this city. And, you know, I think over the generations we have proven to be those New Yorkers who step up in a time of, time of need. So I think we're really eager to hear more about it. And you talked about the private sector helping to pay for some of these things. So what would you do day one to start this conversation with the private sector so that the, you know, the private sector feels like a true partnership in this? Well, look, I'm not, I'm not here today to say you pay for it. I'm saying that we have to work collaboratively in a public-private partnership to resource paid internships. That's something that we can do together, but the city can help. And I have a $200 million plan that will supplement that because look, one of the things we saw Melvin during the pandemic, what was the first thing that we were told during the pandemic? The mayor said, we have to cut summer youth jobs. Mm -hmm. Now we'd never had to do any of that, but that actually got to the core of the problem. Why are the jobs for kids uh, that are crucial for their families financially, why do they always lose? Why aren't we baselining our summer youth jobs program? And why aren't we expanding it to every kid who needs it? And again, because I wanna be cost conscious, there's a number of buckets that we can deal with. First and foremost, the bureaucracy is tweed. I've done the audits simply by streamlining and ending the programs that don't work and redirecting money into the classroom, slashing the bureaucracy there, which is enormous. It's grown so much in the last seven years. We can do a lot of this. There's stimulus money, there's buckets of money, whether it's childcare or other ways to do this. So it's not just dumping on uh, the private sector. It's about all of us coming up with a comprehensive package. And, you know, as you know, I have no problem asking the private sector to step up, do more, pay more. But look, it, when it comes to education, we can get those internship programs together, uh, working with all of us. Thank you for that. And since we're talking about money, let's talk, let's, let's uh, transition to some budget questions. Uh, this is an area that you have a lot of experience in. Um, and, you know, when we talk about sort of those running for mayor and, and, and some of the concerns that, that are top of mind, you know, we are really looking at strategies and policies about uh, fiscal responsibility and ways uh, to bring the, the, the city back, right, economically. Um, and according to uh, the current mayor, uh, there's about a $1.5 billion revenue decline due to the pandemic is what I heard. Um, and this is predominantly driven by a $2.5 billion decline in, in property tax revenue, right? But the budget gap in the city has increased substantially and there are new totals around 5.25 billion and Andrew can correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, on, on this call. Um, and this is an increase from the $3.75 billion budget gap in November of 2020. As the city controller, uh, you have exposed budgetary waste and financial mismanagement, which you talked a lot about this morning. How will you use your financial expertise to address the budget gap and to really steer us in an economic recovery um, that is more long-term than short-term? Well, one of the ways you'll know about how I would approach the budget is how I've done my job as controller. You know, when COVID hit, uh, 
I was able to document the tremendous loss of revenue, $78 billion. Citizen Budget Commission did it as well. IBO, we worked uh, to make sure that we were getting transparent information out to people. We monitored closely the budget deficits. And when Bill de Blasio, our mayor, said that he wanted to borrow $5 billion, we said, I said, you don't have to do that. We don't need to add more debt service. And if we're gonna borrow money, let's wait to see the outcome of the election because we want that borrowing in our back pocket. I wasn't against borrowing, but it didn't make financial sense then. Uh, instead, what I said was he should look at efficiencies in city agencies, uh, root out the waste of outside contracts and bloated budgets. And we did that in our own office. I'm the only elected official that actually voluntarily sent money back to the general fund. I cut 5% of my budget, didn't cut an employee, didn't cut you know, an essential service, but I knew that we had to save money. And that helped us because while property taxes went down 2.5 billion, we also saw other business uh, revenue come to fruition at 2.7 billion. And we had this money of efficiency savings, which brought us closer to a balanced budget. And I'm very proud to say, Melva, because I don't usually talk about this, but as controller, we were able to refinance uh, debt at low interest rates, working with OMB, that ended up becoming 40% of the savings plan, which is huge. And as controller, uh, the pension fund, which by the way, Stephen, is now estimated at the value is $240 billion. Uh, we hit our actuarial target of 7% because that's the job of the controller. You got to get to your 7%. We've exceeded that. We're at 9%. And part of the reason we're at 9% is because I managed this office very well. And I was able to consolidate the five different pension funds into one investment meeting, something no mayor or controller was ever to do. And the result of that is we were able to have more nimble investments. And part of the reason I think we got to 9% was because we managed the system well. And I tell you this story because if we're gonna bring back our small businesses, if we're going to deal with the challenge of vacant commercial space, if we're going to understand that in our immigrant communities and challenged communities economically, all eyes must be on this part of opening the economy. Wall Street made $38 billion during this pandemic. Yeah. People who got hurt were the people that need the help the most from the stimulus pack package, from PPP, from all the things that we need to do. Yeah, and, and thank you for ending on talking about, because I know that management of the current budget is, is extremely important when thinking about cost savings and, and how to sort of fill those budget gaps. But bringing in new uh, areas of revenue are also extremely important um, and something that we are very interested in hearing about creative and innovative, innovative ways to do that. But just to really talk about um, uh, the stimulus fund for a minute, you know, you've recognized that the stimulus fund uh, that the federal government uh, is, 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 is um, allocating is temporary. And you've also underscored sort of the need to jumpstart the recovery while placing the city on a solid fiscal footing for the future, which thank you, I agree. Um, as mayor, which agencies and or programs would you focus spending for for short term and how would you balance that with long term priorities? Well, look, I do believe that talk is cheap, that if you're going to be an aspirational mayor with big plans, you also have a, to have a strategy to pay for it. Some of what I would ask uh, if we don't, because you're absolutely right, and I've said this, stimulus money is a two year situation. Maybe it spills over to the third year. But look, we are going to need uh, new ways to raise revenue. I have no problem asking the wealthiest people in the city to pay more, especially if we're willing to talk about building real low-income housing to slash the amount of money we're spending to maintain the homeless crisis. I really believe we could direct new subsidies uh, to create the low-income housing that we need. I have a specific plan how to access the vacant commercial properties that the city owns. Uh, I'm sorry, the vacant land that the city owns rather than give that land uh, to you know, luxury developers who can't build low-income housing, let's give it back to the people. Let's give it to community-based organizations. That is something that is centered to what I want to do with the subsidy to pay for it. And Melba, I want us to start thinking big again. You know, LaGuardia built the first public housing in 1938. It was aspirational housing. Whether you were a new immigrant or somebody who lived in a tenement, when you got a NYCHA apartment, 
you were on your way. I grew up in Washington Heights, not far away from Dykeman houses. And this was the housing that we all went to because of the open space. We stopped divesting from it, but that was real. Michelama housing was built in the 50s and 60s. It was a state, federal, city program. It was housing for the middle class. We did that in, in those decades. And Ed Koch, he gave abandoned buildings back to community organizations, revitalized the Bronx, spent billions of dollars on low-income housing. We got off track in the last seven years. We built more housing for families of three that made $150,000 than we did for families of three that make under 40,000. And as a result, we doubled the amount of money we spent on homeless services and shelters. And lastly, I just wanna to say to people, you know, when I audit city agencies, yeah, a lot of it is just, hey, you didn't spend well here, you didn't do this. And, but every once in a while, you do an audit of homeless shelters where the children are, zero to three. Imagine walking in and being an auditor and finding uh, mice droppings in a crib or a crib next to an overheating uh, radiator. For the parents and grandparents out there, I don't think you can even imagine that ever happening. But yet in our homeless shelters, it's the state of play. So we need to raise revenue. We need to use stimulus money wisely. We also need to tell New Yorkers specifically how we're gonna meet the financial crisis. So just to stay on the housing and, and you know, you, you talked about uh, affordable housing and NYCHA, and I know you've been very critical of the current housing policies um, and have delayed the focus on affordable housing and working to combat homelessness um, and preserving existing affordable housing and reforming NYCHA um, are part of your plan, right? How do you plan to work with groups like NYCHA uh, to ensure another sort of affordable housing nonprofit organizations to ensure that facilities are livable and meeting the needs of tenants. So not only sort of the upkeep and the conditions, but also the workforce development and training opportunities for lower income uh, New Yorkers living in, in, in low income housing. You know, last, last winter, right before the pandemic, I got a call around Christmas time about a NYCHA development in El Barrio uh, that had no heat. I arrive in the lobby. And the people who meet me in the lobby, there's a woman who just got out of the hospital in her pajamas because she had heart surgery. There's another woman with two little kids who were freezing and they had no hope that they would ever have heat again. Now, because the city controller shows up in the lobby, the heat goes on, but this plays out every which way. We have seen apartments where there was more ice on the inside of the windowsill than on the outside. NYCHA is broken. And this administration mismanaged this from day one. I'm going to have to deal with monitors and experts and temporary czars and all the people that you know we're gonna layer management. I'm moving NYCHA management into City Hall. We're gonna create a real professional operation. We're gonna go building by building I'm prepared to put up $1.5 billion in capital money to get this done. I'm prepared to go to the state and ask for a match. I'm gonna ask business leaders, you and Stephen and Abney to come with me to Washington with union leaders and advocates to finally get NYCHA, the federal money we need. You know, Republican admin and Democratic administrations have this one thing in common when it comes to NYCHA, they don't give anything and that's nonsense. But we're also gotta be creative. I have a plan to use Battery Park City Authority excess money, $40 million a year for 10 years. Let's bond that money. Let's show that New York City can create our revenue stream, a new revenue stream for NYCHA. Three people can do this today, the mayor, the controller, and the governor. And if we were able to do that, we can start fixing those windows, fixing the repairs, the lighting in NYCHA, the stairwells. You know, I think every elected official who wants to run for office, you know, 101 on candidate manual, go visit NYCHA developments and see what is going on. Stop talking about it. And that is gonna be part of my plan. By the way, I've audited NYCHA 15 times, the most of any controller in modern history. Wow. Um... So I'm going to just shift for a minute. Um, you know, at the beginning of this uh, or the middle of this discussion, we talked a lot about sort of the economic recovery of the city and making sure that we have streams of revenue coming back to support and fund the things, some of the things you talked about, but really to get the city going. And one of the things that will contribute or make this uh, a reality is making sure that the city is safe. 
right? And public safety is uh, not only a concern for our membership, but it's a concern for everyone. And how we do it, how we do it equitably um, is a question that we've asked all the mayoral candidates. Uh, and similar to the 2013 mayoral election, public safety and police reform was at the top of uh, the, the conversation and carried many of the mayoral debates as, as you probably remember. Now it's 2021 and we're still talking about how do we keep the city safe um, and uh, do it in a way that it, it is uh, respectful and, and equitable across communities uh, so that we all sort of live in, uh, in, in, in this thriving city. In regard to police reform, you have proposed eliminating overtime as a bonus for making uh, arrests and capping uh, the amount of overtime that's permitted. Uh, arguing that capping overtime would accomplish two goals, cutting costs and reducing officer fatigue. How might both the reduced cost and reduced officer fatigue benefit communities and how do you think that will improve relationships? The, look, the, the, the challenge right now is to deal with a reality. We know in a very predictable way where the serious crime is occurring. We know the neighborhoods, we know where it's happening. And yet the clearance rates, meaning the, uh, the, the number of cases that are closed to stop this violent crime is at an all time low of 26%. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that we're putting senior police personnel in the neighborhoods where the crime is occurring. We've got to up clearance rates. We need to dedicate more resources to that. And that's part of my community safety plan because we need a safe city and everybody in every community is entitled to that. But we also have to have a very serious discussion about over-policing in this city. And when you think about the fact that 40% of 911 calls are not for a crime, well, we have to finally realize that maybe we don't need an over-police response in so many of our neighborhoods, especially in communities of color. And I wanna change that. I wanna have mental health professionals respond to episodic mental health events. I want city personnel to respond to quality of life issues. And I want the police to do the work, the serious work that they have to do. But as part of looking at resources, we should shift resources into the programs we know that works. We should have violence interrupters in communities to work with our kids. We should model what's being done in Eugene, Oregon with the CAHOOTS program. You know what happened there, Melva? 24,000 calls to 911 about mental health issues. They sent mental health professionals out. And then you know how many times they needed the police? 150 times. We are no longer the thought leaders on policing. And that's because the mayor lost control of the police department. The police department thinks they lost control of the mayor. Everyone lost control of everybody else. But who is the ones that are hurt? Innocent demonstrators who want to express support for black lives get batoned and, 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 and hurt during that in this city? That's not supposed to happen. And so I'm going to have a police commissioner that's aligned with my values. Everybody knows I know how to manage. I'll have zero tolerance for the nonsense. We're gonna keep the city safe, but we're gonna also do it through a social justice lens and finally make sure that we have a city for everybody and a justice system that works for everybody. Thank you for that. And, and you know, when we talk about bringing the city back, safety is one piece, um, but something else is making sure that our city is healthy, right? And, um, you know, you've created a fair shot NYC uh, program, a vaccine equity plan to ensure that New Yorkers across backgrounds, income levels, occupations, age groups, all of these things have, uh, these groups have equitable access to vaccines as the city ramps up. And we're starting to see that now, thank goodness. Um, what do you hope to learn from the rollout of this plan regarding health disparities, not only from COVID-19 pandemic, but also from other New York City public health challenges? And we know many of the communities that uh, We've, we've seen bear the brunt of uh, the negative uh, outcomes of COVID-19 with uh, you know, a, a cr increased numbers of deaths and cases in certain communities. Um, 
but what do you learn? What, what do you think we've learned in terms of health disparities um, from other New York uh, public challenges, public health challenges throughout the city, notably in these low income neighborhoods um, amongst immigrant New Yorkers, uh, BIPOC communities, black indigenous and you know, communities of color? Um, what are the lessons learned uh, around health disparities and how to come back from that? Well, let me, let me thank you personally. There's nothing more exciting to me than someone who actually reads my policy papers. So thank you. And anyone on this call, I have a hundred reports for you to digest by the next time we meet. So study up. So that, so thank you, Melvin, for that. But well, so you can thank my staff because, you know, I got the cliff note version, but <laughs> yeah. well, well, tell me who they are because they're my kind of people. Okay. So, so look, COVID was the great discriminator and COVID showed us. And this was the conversation I had with my mom's doctor when she passed away in the Bronx hospital. It's terrible to talk about, but I talk about it a lot because it really impacted me. He, the doctor said to me, you know, in this hospital, people are dying who are black and brown, people who are in their forties and fifties. He said, because for so long we've managed people's illnesses in communities of color. We didn't solve these issues and government has to bear responsibility. When you overlay the environmental racism and the decisions that were made over decades, where to put dirty bus depot stations and, and uh, uh, you know, garbage facilities and all the things that, and peaker plants, all the things that cause cancer and cause all of these illnesses, COVID snapped up the people who were living in communities like this in a heartbeat. People were dying because they were overrun. And the lesson now is there's three prongs to this recovery. There's the economic crisis we talked about. There's a social justice crisis with policing and how we get to a good place. But there is the third prong, which is the health disparity question and how we're going to work with our community providers, health and hospitals, making sure that we finally direct the resources we need so that communities in the Bronx and in Queens and Brooklyn the communities that have long been, uh, who've all lacked resources for healthy uh, opportunities, that's what the next mayor has to do. Open things differently to solve these problems because look, it's COVID today, but I don't want us to be in a position that we didn't learn from this. And lastly, I'm, I'm doing an investigation of the, of the administration as it relates to their COVID response. It really isn't about City Hall. It really is so that we can get a full understanding of what we did right, what we did wrong. Unfortunately, the the City Hall is not turning over the documents, so we're in court and this will be a legal battle. But look, the next mayor will have the benefit of the research that I do. Hopefully I'll be able to be the one. As long as I did the research, I may as well be the mayor. And that we can then, you know, figure out how we can create protocols so this never happens again. Thank you for that. And before I bring Stephen on to have the last word or question, um, speaking of being the next mayor, uh, what is your road to victory? How will you become the city's next mayor? You know, this, you know, this is a, you know, I, I'm the, believe it or not, I'm the only candidate that actually won citywide office. And so I've been in every shul, synagogue, church, civic association from Queens to Brooklyn to Manhattan and people know me and I'm looking forward to safely getting out there as we have been to build this amazing coalition. We have the most diverse coalition of supporters, both in terms of labor, elected officials. Uh, we have a great opportunity to win this. And look, for me, I close well, you know, when I ran for borough president, I wasn't supposed to win. I closed strong. When I ran against Spitzer, I was 20 points behind. Everyone was calling me up saying, um, sorry, it happens. And we closed strong. And I have a hunch that as people focus on the mayor's race, if they want somebody who is a progressive Democrat, someone who's a forward thinking leader, but also who can walk into city hall on day one and go to work, somebody who has a proven track record of doing transition well, meaning bringing the best and the brightest into government, there's no doubt I will win this primary. I feel very strongly about it. You know, and I put together a couple of shekels. I have a couple of dollars in the bank uh, to 
you know, make sure that I get my message out. I think we're $9.1 million, a lot of low dollar contributions. So I'm good to go. I'm fired up. You know, I want to get this going. Shekels. I think that's a new word I learned today. I always say put a little, put, put, put a little aside for Scott. You know, that's how we do the- <laughs> Thank you. And thank you for joining us this morning. And Stephen? Melba, thank, thank you. Uh, Melba, Scott, thank you, Scott. Look, um, we most of all uh, at Abney, and you know this well, we love people who have thoughtful ideas about the city and putting two teachers in the school. I've always found the best ideas are some of the most obvious ideas, the ones that we don't necessarily get to. So I want to thank you for laying out such a thoughtful plan for education for us here. And, uh, you know, we wish you nothing but the best, and we know we're going to see you again soon. So thank, thank you, but thank you, thank you, Abney, thank you, Stephen, Melvin, thank you. Be thank safe. You.